Welcome back to Arts District from Rocky Mountain PBS. Coming up, beauty and entropy combine at this little shop of horrors. Denver's own Birdie Magazine keeps local art alive through print. Plus, homegrown Pueblo Chili, a visit to the KUVO Performance Studio and more. I'm Kate Perdoni. And I'm Michael Gadlin. Welcome back to Arts District from Rocky Mountain PBS. So, Amber is a gardener. And Ian is a taxidermist. And both of them are passionate about nature and things that are just a little strange. Let's see what happens when this couple combines their talents inside their own one-of-a-kind plant shop in Denver. As they put the terror in terrarium. The decay and the regrowth of this the process of these living creatures taken by the earth and then new life sprouting from it, I just love that cycle. And the cool thing about the terrariums that made me get into them was the fact that you become part of that process. The decay and regrowth is facilitated by you, you taking care of your peace. And I just thought it was really magical to think of yourself in such a bigger concept. Entropy and, and regrowth, it happens to everyone and everything. It feels right to, to make pieces that try to reflect that. The terrarium shop is a story of a taxidermist and a gardener who met and fell in love. While the word terrarium is a amalgamation of the words terror and terrarium, we bring kind of a spooky twist to terrariums. He likes to say it's spooky, but I don't really think it's spooky. I think it's beautiful because it really encompasses like the processes of decay and growth in our products. I think a plant inside the mouth would look pretty cool, especially because this guy happens to be missing his teeth. I grew up in Colorado, hunting and fishing in the mountains. When I found out that I could start giving Amber bones and skulls instead of like <laughs> bouquets of flowers. <laughs> um, he brings you so many bones and he's like, I just found this for you. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> I think that's really how I want her heart. With, uh, <laughs> dead things? Through the dead things. but. Um, when I first started doing this, I started doing it when I was little. I used to go to greenhouse with my mom all the time, and yeah, she would let me like pick up all the flowers that I found on the floor. I remember I was walking, and I saw this like half deer face when I was walking, and it had plants coming out of it, and that's like when I started incorporating live plants. I was like, this is amazing. It's just so cool to see this creature being like taken by the earth again, and new life sprouting out of it. And that's where the whole idea of plants, bones came in. I've been making these little like mini scenes or mini worlds terrariums for a really long time. And I had met Ian. Yeah, it was about three years ago. And it was our first holiday together and I had gifted him one of my creations. And that's where it all took off. He's like, these are really, you know, cool. And it, back then it was, it was simple. A muskrat skull that she had found situated amongst some cacti and some <laughs> rocks. And it was, it was very simple, but it, I found it to be clean and beautiful and really represented rebirth from death. You know, I'm almost thinking the possum might be the right size for that one. When we got in the studio together, him and I, our brains just kind of took off. <laughs> <laughs> it was like these weird synapses would fire. Some of our, I think our best ideas have come up, definitely, is just working together in the studio. Yeah, definitely. And it used to be all at our house, but now we have this great shop, and it's like now we get to expand on that even more. So. Ian does the processing, he does the dead things, I do the live things, we always joke about that. We have a little roadkill kit, you know, that contains <laughs> gloves and plastic and things, so if I do come across, you know, something that is met an ignominious end, that I can take care of it in a sanitary fashion. So the goal is to get something like this free of all this, all these little stringy bits. <laughs> it's not glamorous, it's not glamorous, like I don't, yeah, I can't stress that enough. Ian preps the skulls open, and I bring them to the space, and that's where I kind of make the creations here. So all my pieces kind of symbolize an experience I've had. I try to think of like moments in time and recreate those. Like it's become a 3D memory for me. When I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about experiences in nature, but also textures, colors, the way that they'll grow over time to fill the piece is really important. 
And I think about like all the functional aspects yeah. of things too, like <laughs> adequate drainage. And so I take the time to go ahead and bore holes through the bottoms of all the glass. Yeah. Just being in this space makes me so happy. It feels um, so good. It does, and I, I love seeing all the life that also is happy in here too. I will always be a little bit of grumpy in the morning, but <laughs> <laughs> I need a pot of coffee. In the mornings, I love coming in here. It's just so much fun to have a space to decorate that. And We're also kind of hoarders people. too with like cool, like old stuff. So we've been able yeah. to take a lot of the stuff out of our house and be like, good. I mean, I guess you just get to do create every day, yeah. which is like being able to bring a part of nature into your home and like interact with it is really magical. No, not everyone has the accessibility to it nowadays. Not everyone has the time to get out into nature. So being able to have a piece of that in your house, I think it's really amazing. Beautifully put. The terrarium shop opened its doors earlier this year, and they've even started offering classes. That's right. Now, even you can learn how to make a terrarium of your very own. For all the details and to visit their online shop, you can visit theterrariumshop.com. Okay, so Michael, what's edgy, artsy, retro, and free all across the Colorado Front Range and beyond? Well, Kate, that's a great question. I have the answer right here. <laughs> it is Birdie Magazine. The Denver-based Birdie Magazine showcases local artists through their mission of creating an awesome alternative culture magazine. So the first time I saw one of these was at the Denver Zine Fest in, I think, 2015, and I knew I had found my people. I love it. Contributing producer Alex Tuscanes introduces us to the Birdie creators, giving us a glimpse into the team that's keeping print alive. We had very humble beginnings, which we still do. Me, Johnny, and Michael King. We met in uh, Johnny's 600 square foot Capitol Hill apartment um, and decided that there was something lacking within our community. We just felt like there was this hole within um, the culture here in Denver. We felt that people still cared to have a palpable magazine to look at, put on your coffee table, to enjoy it as something tactile. We wanted to make a living being creative but also do something that contributes to the, the world and helps make the culture better and more interesting. Why not kind of like, not reinvent the wheel, but get a little bit more creative and see what you can do just outside of a traditional format. So we spearheaded it from there and launched the first magazine in January 2014 with $2,000 and one month of content. Our sale is just Birdie magazine. If we could have like holographs coming out of Birdie, we totally would do it, you know? We love 70s and 80s, the old school vibe, digital art, but mixed in with that analog feel. We're, you know, influenced by film and punk and music. A lot of people would classify like what we print as kind of a lowbrow art style, but um, we love contemporary art, um, abstract, poetry, comedy, and irreverence. One of our baseline fundamental pillars of Birdie is art as resistance. You know, even if you're not able to go out there and march or um, you don't have money to, to give, um, making art in and of itself is um, the ultimate form of resistance in our opinion. Nonviolent. Yep. Artists are really brave people. We really do think that we need to respect art and the disenfranchised, the misfits of our community, the underrepresented, that might not necessarily uh, get into another publication. We print what we want. When we started, we had no submissions, and now it's just nonstop. It's not just art, it's, it's writers, it's comedians, it's filmmakers, you know, bands. You know, we're, we're able to represent uh, a place for people that, um, you know, don't usually have a place to shine. Just, you know, a platform of diversity, inclusivity. We're quite multi-generational, multi-background, um, and that's really important. Obviously, we do have some, you know, language in our magazine, but it's an all-ages publication. There's nothing more exciting to me to print a little six-year-old's cartoon because it is beautiful. It's art. Hopefully, anybody can pick it up and appreciate it. We fought to have good quality product. So the cost of it, yeah, it's a pretty penny to make it. 
our model for advertising is quite different. We actually don't call them advertisers, they're friends and benefactors, but yeah, the large majority of our funding comes from those advertisers. We design about 90% of our ads. We're creating your own custom piece of art every single month. We are artists ourselves, so we want to uh, approach it from a place where it's more content driven than ad driven. Like we don't, we don't sell our back cover. That's a piece of art. Our centerfold is art. If we don't do it the way that, that is uh, soulful and respects the art, then we're not interested. When you start a company, we're, you know, we probably make two cents an hour. So, you, you know, really when all said and done, we're sleeping a little bit more now. And, and you know, we have food and toilet paper and all that stuff. But like, it, it really is like what we're doing for the community is very, it's quite philanthropic as well. Art is worth a lot, you know, like uh, people don't value it like we feel that they should. And when we began, um, you know, the whole print is dead mentality was out there. And that was uh, really scary and difficult and got a lot of lashback at first, you know, from different people. Hey, you're never going to be able to, you know, make this a thing, but it's just perpetually growing. Revenge of the magazine. <laughs>a box that contains a set of cards, a wall where a sequence of images has been placed. It could be a sculptural book that people would see from a number of different angles. We really want people to understand that books still are relevant, but books might look different. Minnesota Center for Book Arts is a nonprofit visual arts center that focuses on the arts of the book. It opened its doors in 1985. We're proud to say that we're the largest and most comprehensive center of its kind in the world. From the very beginning, it's always been about community for the center in terms of having multiple access points for the services and the programs that we offer. So we have programs that span from preschoolers to master artists. In our main gallery, we have about four shows each year. The gallery really gives us the opportunity to engage the public, educate, and show them just how far this idea of book can go. We have a retail shop called The Shop at MCBA. We're consigning well over 300 different artists representing their work, and it's a wonderful shop in many different ways. First and foremost, it's to provide income to artists. There's a number of different ways that artists can engage with MCBA. There's always been a constant stream of very talented artists and residents that have worked in the space, both in printing, binding, and paper. That continues today in projects like the Winter Book. The Winter Book is a publication that we think of as our flagship publication. We try to incorporate the different traditional methods that are being done in our studios. The Winter Book is hand printed, it's hand bound. We have a great community that comes in and helps with it. 
We have master binders and master printers. It really celebrates the idea of craft. It's a wonderful way for us to demonstrate what we do here at the center and what we stand for. So each year when we do a winter book, it's, it's quite unique. We start with the text and then we work off of that. This is the winter book that we did in 2013. It's done with paper that we made in our studios here. It's all about this relationship to the earth. This is a book called Come and Get It, Poetry and Three Stories by Kevin Kling. He has put down on paper a performance piece that he did. This is a winter book that we did in 2007. It was an anthology of visual poets called Vizpoology. So within, you have a score for a performance. You have additional prints and broadsides, different games that you can play. You have books in the form of a set of foreign language cards dealing with a made-up alphabet. All of these are examples of winter books. And each one kind of uses the structure of the winter book, the materials that go into it to best tell the message. So the importance of the winter book being made by hand is um, a celebration of the tradition of all of the crafts that go into making a book. This year's winter book, it's the 25th book, and it's a collection of writing from the community members. So it's the first time ever that the writing has come from the actual makers um, that work at the Center for Book Arts. The people who work here know so much about what it means to shape something by hand, be this paper making or book binding or printing. Uh, we know about that. So we are calling it from the center on community and practice of making. And so we wanted to really acknowledge not just the people who've worked on the book, but all the other people. The mission of Minnesota Center for Book Arts is to lead the advancement of the book as an evolving art form. We have a dedication to preserving the traditions, but we also want to encourage experimentation. We want to be able to offer artists the opportunity to express themselves in a way that makes sense to their contemporaries. I like to think of Minnesota Center for Book Arts as a full resource for artists to come in and create. We have a very inspiring space to work in. We have great instructors, that it's a place where people can come and explore, they can appreciate, they can master skills, or they can just come here and be inspired. Up next, the weather is perfect in Pueblo, Colorado. Perfect for growing and harvesting the city's famous Pueblo chili. I am a huge fan. I cannot live without green chili. What about love you? Love green chili. Yeah. Love it on a lot of things. Like what? Smothered burrito. Yeah. I can't do a dry burrito. <laughs> I ain't gonna do a dry burrito. I'll even try it on toast. Oh my gosh, I love green chili. I had it last night on my grilled cheese. I'm telling you, the Colorado Springs Gazette's Hannah Tran has this story from Pueblo, Colorado, home of the green chili. We are most known for our Pueblo Chili. Hatch, New Mexico is our biggest competition. Every year we seem to plant a little bit more. Because as the Pueblo Chili name gets out, I think we're getting more people from out of town to come and get Pueblo Chili. So we've been growing and producing a lot more in the last couple years. Ever since we started growing Pueblo chili, there's always been a rivalry between Hatch, New Mexico. They've been growing it for so long and they produce such mass quantities, but ours is a lot bigger, a lot meatier, a lot spicier, just all the way around better. Our weather is perfect for Pueblo chili. We have hot days and then cool nights, so that helps it mature a lot faster. 
just started recently competing with them on the same level. Most that used to sell hatch have switched over to Pueblo Chili just because they want to support their community and buy local. I think Pueblo Chili is just going to keep growing. We just started in the last two years with a Pueblo Chili Growers Association and that has help, helped us prosper and get bigger and get our name across the United States more than just in Colorado. You can find Pueblo Chili at farmers markets and roadside stands. For more great videos featuring local arts and culture, check out our content partners at the Colorado Springs Gazette at gazette.com slash video. This next story immediately captured my attention because it has a pretty big tie-in to one of my own heroes and inspirations, PBS's own Bob Ross. The artist in this next story was hugely inspired by Bob Ross and even got to meet him at a young age, which set him up for a career in the arts. But it's not what you think. He's not just painting happy little trees. Christopher Segi wanted to be an artist from a young age, and he also wanted to be a police officer. And he combines both of these passions to help put criminals behind bars. Our partners at WUCF Orlando bring us this story. Whenever there's a, a significant crime that happened, I will meet with a victim or the witness of the crime and see if they can recall what the, the person looked like that committed it. My whole life, I've, I've wanted to be a police officer, and, and I've always had a passion for art. When I was 11 years old, flipping through the channels, and on PBS, Bob Ross was on. You know, this guy's knocking these paintings out in a half hour, and it looks easy. So I saved up a few months, and I went up, and I, I bought the, the Bob Ross paint set. And I started knocking out these oil paintings. My parents have a, a radio show, and they said, uh, we have a surprise for you. We got Bob Ross to come and be on the radio show. I was all excited. I'm like a kid in the candy store. I went, I got all my oil paintings together. I grabbed them all, and I went to my dad's studio, and, and there he was, and I, I showed him my work. And he said, Chris, how about one day you and your family come out to my house, you live in Longwood, and uh, we'll do a painting. So we went out to his house, and we went into his studio, and he put one of the paintings that he had up on the wall. And he says, paint that painting. And he watched me paint it, and till this day, I, I still have that, that painting. That's when I knew that this was something that I, that I wanted to do. That's something that, that just ran parallel throughout my life, was being an artist and wanting to be a police officer. A lot of times, when I sit down with a victim, they're nervous, understandably. You're asking for someone to do this who, who just went through probably the most traumatizing time in their life. You're having them relive this horrible moment. You're, you're telling them, hey listen, take that guy that did this horrible thing to you, burn his image in your head, and tell me what he looks like. So the, the actual drawing part isn't difficult for me. It's getting the information out of them. It's easier to recognize somebody than it is to recall them. And the way I do that is I have a book and it's broken down to different categories. Shapes of faces, different eyes, different noses, different mouths, and we just concentrate on each thing at a time. But he may have had a, like a scar or a tattoo on his face. I really couldn't tell. Do you know, tell. do you remember where? Like, like under his eye. And it was his left eye? Yes, it was okay. his left eye. And I don't show it to him as I draw it. I draw the whole thing, it's a preliminary sketch, and then when it's all said and done, I'll show it to them. I'll have them rate it, scale the one to ten. I, I would rate that as a, probably a seven. A seven? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking that um, his cheeks may have been a bit fuller. Once we agree on that, I then go back to the computer. I'll redraw it using the pencil sketch that I just did. I'll put a pose to the person, make them come to life, and, and airbrush it and, and make it look like the drawings you see. As an artist, I believe that to, to make a portrait, to make an image, you, you have to you have to draw it. You know, you got to you got to bring that out, and you, you got to make it come to life. The, the drawings that that I create, they really look lifelike. It is very beneficial, especially when uh, when we can get a good drawing out of it. it. It really helps the detectives out a lot. It is very rewarding, it, just as it is for any detective or police officer on the street. Anyone in law enforcement, if you can get the bad guy off, you're rewarded. And if this is the way I do it, it, it is very, very rewarding for me. Next, we head to the KUVO Phyllis A. Greer Performance Studio. Take it away.
Thanks for joining us on Arts District. You can check us out on Instagram for more on Colorado artists. And a behind the scenes look at the making of this show. And you can always watch us online anytime. I'm Michael Gadlin. And I'm Kate Perdoni. Until next time. Make it easy. But, but make, make it. it.